Good. Well, we're going to mix things up a little bit this morning, and instead of uh, at this point in our service, where we take up our tithes and offerings and watch our video announcements, we're going to do that at the end of the message, just to keep you on your toes. And so please be prepared to give. I have not forgotten that. We will be taking up our regular tithes and offerings. But we just felt like this word, because I'm going to do a couple things this morning. I'm going to teach our portion of Peter. And then I want to give you a short exhortation. And really, I am speaking for the elders. I will deliver to you uh, a, an important exhortation. I want to challenge and encourage you in your faith this morning. And uh, Rodney's prophetic word was so timely to that end. And then I'm going to read a prophetic exhortation that we received this week from Jenny that was very encouraging. And I want to bring it to you this morning because we feel like it's very much in line with what we are sharing. So open your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter and stand before the Lord. I want to read these verses from 1 Peter 4. If you are new with us, we have been teaching through the book of 1 Peter in a series called Transforming Grace. And we are in the fourth chapter. Just so you know, get your moorings. I intend to finish this through the month of November as we give our attention into December to the Christmas season. We are in chapter 4, very important verses beginning in verse 7. <clears throat> the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. And let's say it together. Amen. Father, your Spirit breathed these words 2,000 years ago, and they describe what you're trying to do at Trinity 2,000 years later. So give us ears to hear this text the way the Spirit originally intended that to be heard, and show us how we should respond in grace to this truth of Holy Scripture, to the glory of God and the Lord Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. Next, last week, we saw in the text, verses 1 through 6, that all of us were part of a community before we were regenerated. It was a pagan community. And Peter goes to great lengths to, to describe what it was like, what life was like in a pagan community. If you notice, when we read today's text, verses 7 through 11, Peter is now giving a stark contrast to his previous description of pagan life. He now is being positive about how we, as the Christian community, are different in every way from the life we used to live in paganism. Instead of drunken debauchery, there is now soberness and clear-headedness. Instead of love now fills our hearts, instead of lust. Instead of orgies, the Christian home is now open to hospitality, love, and kind-heartedness. Instead of exploiting one another, we are now serving and ministering to one another with the gifts that God has given. What Peter is really saying in this passage is that now that we have been delivered from our former lifestyle in paganism, we now live as responsible stewards 
in the community of the king. And I don't think I'm overstating it this morning when I say that the word steward, at least in my mind, sums up everything God intends for us to be and do. I've come to relish the word steward. And I think in these verses, Peter is telling us how to be faithful stewards of both ourselves and the gifts that God has given to us to the community. Now, you know, I don't think I need to, but in case there is someone in the assembly that doesn't understand this term steward, simply put, a steward is a person who really knows that he or she belongs to the Lord. And that because they belong to the Lord, everything they have, everything they do, belongs to the Lord. It's simple to state it. Most of us could probably have given such a clear definition. But living it out, living life as a steward, requires a lifetime of learning by God's grace. And I believe Peter is telling us that we are to become stewards in three specific ways based on this text. In other words, when these three things are happening, folks, our stewardship becomes a reality. We live it out. And we do so in three ways based on this text. Number one, by understanding the time of our stewardship, verse 7. Number two, serving in the grace of our stewardship, verses 8 through 11a. And then finally, grasping the purpose of our stewardship, verse 11b. Number one, understanding the time of our stewardship. How many remember last week we saw that pagans fail to recognize that their accountability to the Lord. There is a day of judgment coming, and pagans fail to realize that they're accountable. The, that day is fast approaching, and if you're pagan, you don't know it. But P Peter says the believer knows it. And he knows it because of statements such as verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. It is near. Now, when we hear statements like that in the modern church, the end of all things is near. What do we usually think of? I, I jotted down a couple today. Jesus is coming any minute. Uh, and he may be, because every chart I've ever had, I've had to rip up. But we usually think of what we cut our teeth on called prophecy teaching. Jesus is coming soon. Uh, Iran might attack Israel any minute. And there's nuclear bombs being developed in Iran. And we now have the capability to blow up the world several times and so forth and so on. Almost immediately when we read a statement like the end of all things is near, we immediately uh, reflect on our world and to the things that are occurring in our modern age. But there's a problem with that. And here's the problem. Peter wrote that 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, he said the end of all things is near. So I have a question. Was he mistaken eschatologically? Did Peter miss it? No, not at all. You see, the last days, folks, are not the Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday before the rapture, contrary to popular opinion. But they began 2,000 years ago with the appearing of Jesus, His death, His resurrection, and His ascension. Remember when God poured His Spirit out on the day of Pentecost, and they began to speak with other tongues, and Peter stood up to defend what was happening, and he quoted Joel 2. He quoted the great prophecy of Joel 2.28. And here's what the prophecy said, in the last days. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Whatever the last days are, they apparently include the day of Pentecost. They're at least 2,000 years old. Now, here's what the Christian knows. While the Christian knows we are in the last days, 
he or she knows that there will be an end, that there is an end. And for the believer, the end is not just a date on a calendar, but it is thought of as always impending. In other words, uh, the knowledge that there will be an end is to deeply affect us in the present. Some scholars have a cute way of saying that, and it's this statement, the future has invaded the present. The future has invaded the present. The future is there will be an end, there is a day of judgment, there is a sovereign wrapping up of affairs, there is a consummation when the king returns, but all of that is not just a date in the calendar that will happen in time, though it will, but it is now invaded my life. It's the reason I'm here. It's why I believe. Another way scholars have said this is already but not yet. The end is near, but the end has occurred as far as God is concerned, but yet it's not here yet, but it's already here. How do you live in that tension? But that's the Christian life. And this knowledge that the end is near is to deeply affect the way I live. And Peter says, something specific about what it's to do, it is to disturb my complacency so that I live in the present age with a new sense of values, alive unto God and ready for prayer. What does that look like? Peter says, the end of all things is near, therefore be self-controlled. The Greek word literally means be in your right mind. That's what it literally means, be in control of yourself. It is interestingly the same word used for that dude. <laughs> I've been hanging around my son. He said use dude more. You remember the dude who had a legion of demons and he was delivered? And when they came from the city of Gadarene to look at him, it says he was clothed and in his right mind. That's the word in Greek. Peter uses here when he says, be self-controlled, be in your right mind. If you want a steward, you, if you are a steward and you want to steward your gifts, you have to be in your right mind. And Peter also says, be sober. You know what that word means? It means be wide awake. I can't help but imagine Peter was thinking of something when he wrote that. What do you think Peter was thinking of when he wrote, be awake? Yes, when Jesus told him to sit here and pray for one hour in the Garden of Gethsemane, and when Jesus came back, all the disciples were fast asleep. He woke them up, told him pray for another hour, went off, came back, they were fast asleep. I think it was three times they were sleeping. I think Peter learned the lesson. He said, be wide awake. And he tells us to be wide awake, interestingly, for the purpose of prayer. Show of hands, how many would, without me even expounding this text, would acknowledge that if there's one area where you tend to sleepiness, it is prayer. Alan Stibbs says it this way, quote, Christians must now not allow their minds to become fuddled and dazed by drink or drowsiness. They should keep themselves awake and alert with all their faculties under control in order to be able to give themselves to praying. So Peter doesn't think of prayer primarily as something that induces ecstasy, but requires sober, direct, profoundly thoughtful communication with the Lord. Nor does he think of prayer as something cold and rational, sort of, I'm divorced from it, but he thinks of it as fervent love, agonizing intercession. These are the marks of true prayer, and to do so, we must be wide awake. 
You know how it works. You go to set aside an hour for prayer, but you think, because men can't pray without the remote in their hands. This is somewhere in Scripture. I haven't found it yet. I'll just check out the scores from yesterday. I hope you didn't. I hope you oversee. I have to preach this morning with Randy King wearing a crimson tide. Shh. In a minute, I'm going to have a scripture that says, above all, keep fervent in your love one for another. You'll be able to exercise the opportunity. <laughs> so don't jump the gun. But you know, you turn the TV on, I'll check the scores out. 50 minutes later, all your prayer time's been eaten up. Or how many of you purpose to spend an hour with the Lord before anyone's up and you set your alarm, but you hit the dreaded snooze button, you roll over thinking you'll sleep for another five minutes and you look at your clock and you've wasted, you've slept another hour. Peter's exhortation, folks, is well taken. Be awake, be sober. It's the only way to guard your prayer life. And this is a battle everybody has, including those in ministry. Then in verses 8 through 11, Peter tells us not only we must understand the time of our stewardship, but we must serve in the grace of our stewardship. Peter says it this way, I love it. Keep loving one another earnestly. And one way you could translate that, and you would be close to the Greek text, is by the word constant. One translation said it best, keep love constant. In fact, the word in Greek translated uh, earnestly is the Greek word which implies stretching something, like rope, or if you work out. Those of you who work out and you want to tone your body know that you have to stretch your muscles and you get to a place where you feel like you can't go anymore and then Brother John puts 10 more on my thing. He loves me and I, I stretch. And I was injured recently and I just got back in the gym and I discovered that I was going to have to work back up. It had been several weeks, and I couldn't do what I used to, and now I'm almost back at the place. I had to stretch. That's the word Peter uses in the Greek to say uh, that our love should be continually stretched. How many of you have ever reached a point where you said, I'm checking out of the body of Christ. I have no more love to give anyone. And the Lord says, oh yeah, watch this, stretch. And he brings that brother or sister into your life who is destined in God's sovereignty to drive you to sanctification. How many times I've said, I'm checking out of the body of Christ. It ain't working, it's not happening. And God says, you're not checking anywhere. By the way, Peter doesn't leave us in the dark as to what such love looks like. He gives us practical, plain, clear-headed teaching. What does this love look like? He says, it's very easy. You will, if you have this kind of love, cover a multitude of sins. There is no doubt what love looks like. It doesn't expose people. It covers because it forgives. Peter is quoting Proverbs 10, hatred stirs up dissension, but love covers all wrongs. Unless your love and my love can forgive many sins, folks, we've not learned what true love is. And if you are a member of the body of Christ, you will have daily opportunities to exercise this. I think I know where Peter got this. You remember when Peter suggested to Jesus during his earthly ministry, he said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? And Peter was very benevolent. He said, how about seven? And according to rabbinic tradition, three was the maximum 
uh, times a Jew was required to forgive. So Peter's really benevolent here. He's more than doubling it. He says, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven? Jesus says, how about 70 times seven, which is not, it's 490, and you're not done forgiving when you've overstepped 490. There's legalists in our midst, I gotta say that for, it's not, he, he, Peter, Jesus is saying what? This is na no end. You must forgive any time you are wounded by another. And Peter goes on to say this, our love is not emotional, gushy, but moves us to serve our brothers and sisters like the team we worked with yesterday who got up early on a Saturday morning and moved a brother with their trucks and their gloves and all this stuff. That's the love of God. You know, the greatest, the love of God is moving someone. Especially somebody who's lived in Florida. Paul, Peter says, we, we don't just serve because we're emotionally gushing, uh, love because we're emotionally gushing, but we, our love moves us to serve in practical ways. And look at the first thing. One of the ways he says we do this is by offering people the most important thing we have, our homes. Show hospitality to one another. I wish it stopped there without grumbling. Lord, are they coming over again? Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Christianity, I don't know if you know this, made hospitality a sacrament. I found this quote describing hospitality. I like it. Quote, practicing Christian hospitality isn't about glittering, glamorous table settings or platters of picture-perfect food. It's about practicing servanthood right in the middle of your practical Christianity. More important, it's about loving others through Christ and making people feel special. And when the author wrote that and I read it, I said, bingo. Really what hospitality does, it doesn't just meet a need sort of coldly and mechanically. It goes out of its way to make people feel special. Hospitality was much more needed in the first century than today. Christians had to pr pr practice hospitality by giving food and shelter in a home to apostles and prophets who were always traveling through the churches and taking care of those in need. I know a little about this. Before I came back to Trinity in June of 2011, I traveled three weekends on average, some, some months shorter and some longer, but two to three weekends a month I was gone. And 90% of the time, the churches that had me in did not put me in hotels, they put me in homes. And I came to really treasure hospitality. You know, I, I don't mean this, I, I hope this doesn't sound bad because I appreciated any home they put me in, but I soon discovered the homes where people were doing it because the preacher asked, and the homes that really knew what hospitality was. And when you're away from your family, and I never slept well on the road, and you have a family that not only is putting you there, but you can tell they want you there, and they are engaged in practicing hospitality. What a gift. I may have had to sleep on a six-year-old's bed, and there are people in this room who have this gift, and it blesses the body of Christ. Then Peter says, practice each gift. Here's what he says, as some have received a gift, right? We all know that. Everybody look up here. Only some have gifts. Is that what it says? As each has received a gift. Before we go on this morning, what's your gift? What have you received from Jesus? Are you exercising it 
for the community. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Powerful words. Unlike Paul, Peter doesn't bother to give us a long list of gifts. Paul has provided that. There was no need to. But what Peter does is he talks about the gifts being distributed to each. And unlike Paul, he doesn't give a long list, but he categorizes the gifts into two categories, speaking and serving. There are two ways that people minister to the body of Christ. Both of them are service to the Lord and to the saints, but there are speaking gifts and there are serving gifts. But he says all of this comes out of the rich bounty. In the ESV, it says, good stewards of God's varied grace. I like the, e and the NAS better at this. He calls it God's manifold grace. I want to remind you of something. If you prophesy, go out of your way not to prophesy like anybody else. Find out how you should manifest the grace of God. If you wash people's feet, I don't know how you do that differently. That analogy breaks down. <laughs> but be you. Be you in the way the grace of God is being distributed through you. See, Peter is not so much concerned about what the gifts are here, but our attitude towards the gifts, that we are stewards of them. Which means two things. Number one, we are accountable to the master for our gifts. I don't know that a lot of people really believe that. I don't know that there's a lot of Christians that really believe that one day you will give an account and so will I. It's not an issue of heaven and hell if you're in Christ, but you will give an account and I will give an account for what I was given from, by Christ and what I did with it. And there are numerous parables that Jesus told to make this clear. And the second thing that's true of stewards is we are administrators of what we have been given and must actually administrate it in a practical way so there's an effect. Now many believe that the reason Peter distinguishes between speaking and serving is he's really thinking of the leadership or government of the church. And you have uh, elders who teach and speak and deacons who serve. And that's possible here, though I don't think it's limited to that, but it's very clearly probably intended. First of all, he says there are elders who speak, and here's their attitude when they do. Whoever speaks, or it may be prophets, apostles, it's not just elders. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. I do not believe that you are hearing right now a message from Neil Silverberg. I believe that Jesus Christ, by His Spirit, has made, given me a gift and it is Jesus, the teacher, who is teaching you right now. And the attitude that I must have in this ministry, which is what God's given me to do, is I am speaking oracles of God. This requires not only a reverent uh, understanding of what you're doing, but the power of the Holy Spirit so you're not speaking your own words. Peter is not describing here casual conversation. He has in view, clearly, the preaching and teaching ministries of God's Word in the church. Everybody is privileged to speak God's Word in evangelism. But there, have been, there are those who have been given special gifts of preaching and teaching. We had a Master Builders Leaders meeting this week, and we talked about Acts 6 and the diminishing of respect for the Word of God in the church being taught. And we were talking about the, that attitude is there because leaders are partly to be responsible, but also the people need to be instructed. Then Peter says, whoever serves. He puts it in the same sentence. 
listen to me, please. What I am doing right now is vitally important to the health of the church. But what you do in leading a house church, in, in cleaning this building, in prayer and intercession, we have a team that labors every morning faithfully on Sundays in this house. You are doing something as important as what I am doing now. The serving ministry is to be done in the same power of the Spirit that the teaching and prophetic ministry is to be carried out. It takes the same Spirit. Anybody who has served in the ministry of mercy, for example, and there are people in this room who do that better than me, you know the need for patience and the power of the Spirit to carry it out. And then Peter says, let me talk about the purpose of our stewardship, and I'll sum this up really quickly. Who or why does Peter so emphasize our calling to minister as stewards, servants who recognize our dependence on God's gifts? One reason, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. It's not about my ministry, my work, what I get out of it. It is about God being glorified through the work. So many leaders give lip service to God's enabling grace, but trust in management skills and business practices rather than the Spirit of God. Here's Alan Stibbs again, quote, God is glorified when the variety and value of the gifts of His grace are openly manifested in their diligent exercise, and when the ministry thus accomplished is plainly due to God's enabling. I believe God's doing something at Trinity and will do something that no one will ever be able to take credit for but God. And if God's going to get the glory, he has to be source, the source of the power of the ministry being done. I thought of this morning, I'm going to embarrass some people, maybe some aren't here. I thought this morning of three servants who minister in this house day and night and do it in the power of God, thus they give glory to God. And I struggled with whether to point these people out because I'll leave out people that are doing it as well, but I will get to you over the next five or ten years. But they just came to mind. I wasn't thinking about this. I was preparing the message, and I thought of biblical examples. I said, who can I use in Scripture that's a good example of a servant who ministered by the power of the Spirit? And my mind immediately turned, not to Scripture, but to Trinity. People like Sylvia Brown. Sylvia, are you here? Where is she? Oh, you're in the front row. I am in deep trouble. Sylvia serves tirelessly in hospitality ministry and preparing food for weddings and funerals and for all the starting points and her team. And she does it tires tirelessly. If you had a wedding or, God forbid, a funeral in your family, you've been the recipient of Sylvia's love and service. And we are a better church because of it. But more importantly, when she moves in that function with her team, she brings glory to God. Thank you for your service. I thought of Gary Hagerman, sitting as he always is in the back row. Let me tell you something about this man. This man for I don't know how many years shows up here every Tuesday evening with a team tirelessly, and he has a chiropractic practice, he has challenges in his own family, but he is here with a team every Tuesday praying for the sick, praying for the hurt, and not to mention the thousands of people, probably hundreds or thousands, over the years that he has personally visited in their home and prayed for them, and he does it tirelessly, and when I see him doing it, he brings glory to God and Jesus Christ. Thank you, Gary. And last but not least, Curtis Phillips came to mind. 
What an example of serving he has been to this body. He has for years led the usher team in this building and prior to that in our old facility. Serving faithfully out of sight, organizing and taking care of the, uh, the ushering and serving in the ministry of helps. Who was here yesterday at 80 years old with his truck in the freezing cold to move a brother? Curtis was there. And I told him this morning that I'm hurting. He said, I'm not. He's 80. Where's Curtis? There he is. Curtis, when you serve, you do it in the strength that God supplies, and you bring glory to Jesus Christ. Thank you. Uh, and I'm leaving people out, I know, and I, we, it would take countless services to talk about the serving gifts in this church that bring glory to God for their service. The men and women who serve faithfully this morning, they aren't hearing the word because they are faithfully serving our children's ministry. People like Mike and Susie who are downstairs every week serving our children and our, our worship team who is here. And thank God there's more players coming on, but they've, we've had to really scrimp and they are faithful every week. And there's so many other people I could mention, but I mentioned them not to embarrass them but to say when they serve in this capacity, they bring glory to Jesus. Now, I preach too long, but I have an exhortation. It's about stewardship, but it's larger than that. Uh, and by the way, I didn't plan this. Next week, we are going to remember and pray for the persecuted church. And. Uh, I'm glad we do that as a church. We'll watch a short video. We will pray for them. It just so happens the texts next week are dealing with persecution. I didn't plan it that way. I thought, what a blessing. We're going to talk about verses 12 through 19. I want you to read them this week. They talk about suffering as a Christian, which is inevitable. Not only persecuting suffering, but suffering as part of the Christian life. This week as we met our elders team and had a long meeting, we decided that we really want to encourage the church and exhort you at this present time. We're going to be taking up our tithe and offering in a minute, so thank you for remaining. I will not be but a couple minutes. Almost two months ago, we presented to Trinity a new vision that will carry us into the future. It's exciting, definitely challenging, but we are persuaded without any hesitation that it's God's plan for Trinity. We told you two months ago that we are going to be relaunching in January under the name Trinity Community Church. And this body at that time at the end of August voted unanimously, according to our bylaws, 95% agreed that we should put this present facility on the market to sell. We are uh, partly because of financial problem, but not mainly. It because of the larger vision. At that time, over the last seven weeks, we have approached many of the churches in Knoxville that are sizable to see before we listed the building if there's any churches in town that might be interested. We showed it to a few. We've approached some of the larger churches. And now in November, we are going, we have acquired a very astute uh, agent, a, a real estate agent who handles commercial property in Knoxville. He's very well known, considered to be the best. And we will be listing this property uh, November 1st, this coming week. And we uh, believe that we just wanted to give the Lord an opportunity if we could sell it directly in negotiating with a church. That hasn't happened. So we will be uh, pro uh, putting it on the market starting this week. Uh, eventually, Trinity Community Church will not be meeting here unless this building doesn't sell and it serves as our north site, which we're open to realize. But eventually, we will be meeting in two locations for our corporate meetings. We will and will continue to have corporate meetings. I know there's chatter out there and people still saying, well, we're not going to meet on Sundays. Folks, listen carefully to me. We will have regularly, weekly corporate meetings in two locations, in the north and in the west to begin with. And hopefully that's not where it ends. 
Those weekly gatherings will be fully orbed church meetings. We will have children's ministry. We will have worship and teaching of the Word of God as we continue to have here. We've also begun to lay a foundation for new house churches, and over the next few weeks, uh, we're preparing to launch. We're not going to do it now, uh, although one did start this week, but we're going to wait till January because we're coming into the holidays, and we are laying the foundation for several new house churches. I am working on a new house church leader's training manual and a theological manual that we will be using. Now, we uh, realize something. The elders, we realize and are well aware that there is some unsettling in the body and some fear, not to mention many questions that remain unanswered. So beginning this morning with a few facts I've just given you, and then next week on the 3rd we'll give you more, and then between the 3rd of November and the 10th of November we're going to invite you to send us questions via email that we can have because on the night of the 10th of November, I hope everybody's marked this down, uh, we are going to have our next regional community church meeting in the north and in the west. And I think in a week, next week, uh, we'll be uh, letting you know where those locations are. We're firming it up now and we do have a location for each place. That will be at Sunday night, six o'clock, I think, or, or something like that. But we're aware that there's a feeling of unsettledness there's fear, and there's a lot of questions. And by the way, I want to say this clearly. We are not holding anything back from this church, but intend to inform you along the journey and not hold anything back. If we haven't shared with you, it's simply because we are taking the time to solidify details before we stand up here and say things that we will later have to retract. We are not holding back. We're not making decisions and not telling you. We are walking through a process and we will keep you fully informed as we are informed, okay? So please keep that in mind when you do ask questions. We don't have all the details yet, but they will be forthcoming and we will give you more details next Sunday, uh, the third, in this pulpit. Here's the most important thing I wanna say to Trinity right now, hear me. It's very, very important. It's what the two spies who brought a good report back to Joshua when they returned from the land of Canaan. The others said, we can't do it. Here's what two spies say, and I say it to you this morning, we are well able to take the land. Uh, <laughs> folks, we can do this. I am persuaded that we can do this, but it is a faith adventure. There's a few things I want you to realize that are critical to this process. And one of them is our attitudes of faith is critical to this process. We are convinced this is the plan the Lord gave us and that we can do this. And I'm asking every partner at Trinity to partner with us in this venture. I believe as more details come out next week and then between the 3rd and the 10th and when we talk to you, we're gonna answer your questions on the night of the 10th in the regional community meetings. I believe you'll get a clearer picture. But you and I are in this together and we need every partner in this venture right now to stand with us. This is a faith adventure. And we're moving together as a community. And God has been so faithful to be speaking to us and confirming it prophetically. Now, first of all, I want to say a couple things. Number one, we value your input. We need your input. So feel free to input to us because we want to know what you're feeling and thinking. Number two, we need you to continue to be here. I think some people said we're selling the building, that we're not into corporate meetings anymore. We don't have to come. That is not our vision, and that is not right. The corporate meeting is important. We're not abandoning it, so please be committed to it. Of course, I'm preaching to the choir this morning. You're sitting here, but I'm also talking on the Internet and to people that will hear the tape. And we not only need you to be here, everyone listen, we need you to continue to be faithful in your giving. I don't get this, but apparently... 
Some feel that if they miss two or three corporate gatherings, they don't have to tithe. They didn't receive services. And folks, we have to understand that part of our vision is to move out of this facility, but part of our vision is we're still in this facility. So we need you not to pull back, but to partner with us and recognize. Now, I feel kind of stupid to say this because that's not the reason we should be giving anyway. It should be because I'm an obedient disciple. And we've had people pull back because they haven't been here. And by the way, if you know people that are tossed or unsettled or not clear and they're sort of pulled back or pulled out and they're not coming, and you know them, call them. Reach out to them for us. And give them a good report and, say, and, and pull them in and say, let's move together as a fellowship. So we need every partner to continue to be with us in their financial support of the work. If you know, if you're here as a guest, you're probably thinking, oh, there they go again, preachers talking about money. But everybody in this room will bear witness. We rarely talk about it. It is time for us not to pull back and let the enemy befuddle our minds and wonder and have doubt. It is time to rise up with one heart, one mind, one spirit, and say, God has given us a vision. Let's go for it. We can do this. I thought about the future, and here's what excites me, because I see it. People getting saved, new house churches being planted, new community churches being planted. That's our future. We had a very important prophetic word this morning that we're right where God wants us in His sovereignty, even financially. I was sent this from Jenny this week. I want to read it to you in closing. Ushers, I'll be calling Paul up in a minute. I put a message out this week to every Trinity partner, and she said, I wanted to say that I read and am glad for your message on Facebook. I was praying about the church this morning. The Lord showed me a few things concerning the church. I'm not sure if I can write precisely what was revealed, but it goes like this. Not only is the church going through a transition, but the individual members and their families are also going through transition. People are being challenged. It's like a line has been drawn in the sand. People are having to make decisions, holding on or letting go. But this is what I know. The church that emerges from this transition will be built on the rock and they will not be shaken. We may be a few members shorter when all is said and done, but that's okay. People have to make their own decisions. The people that make the decisions to hang and stick it out will be mighty warriors for the Lord. They will be fulfilling His purpose on the earth. God blesses the faithful. God is a multiplier. I see the remaining members living in the love and grace of God. And because of their choice, others will be affected and infected with the love of God and have a desire for the things of God. Trinity is going through the fire, but praise God, we will emerge purer, thus stronger. And I got to read this. She's going to be. Is Jenny here? Where are you? Is it okay that I read this? Okay. I didn't even ask you. I'm sorry. She said, I'm personally not worried about the building. There's an excitement and expectation in my spirit. The church is where we are. The people of God need to hang on. It's going to be a roller coaster of a ride the next few months, but in a good way, not the quote, I think I'm going to throw up way. <laughs> Thank you for being real. So folks, here's what we need. We need you to believe God with us, continue to be present in our gatherings, both in house churches and corporately, and continue to be praying and trusting God, and please, continuing to be faithful in your giving. Paul's going to come now and close out our service and take up our tithe and offering.